Vortex 2 started traveling in earnest after the initial deployment exercise in Kansas. Even during the first couple of nights on the road, Vortex 2 worked hard getting equipment ready to go. We took only momentary stops for food and gas. I hope so. <laughs> Every once in a while, various teams took breaks. In this case, we went to the Dalton Gang hideout. All right. This is the Dalton yes. Gang storm shelter, much like the design of the federal government today. Well, what would they do? It was amazing to think that this structure was actually built back in yeah. the 1800s. Anyway, he uh, never did get any more trouble. You know, he's a pretty well-respected, upstanding citizen. Arriving at our next destination in Amarillo, Texas, got us to even more focus on getting ready equipment points. ready and operational. Various teams worked on cycle times related to deploying and actuating the pods in the field and checking and calibrating their instruments. An exciting daily briefing of severe weather several days out got Vortex 2 mobilized into moving to, to the next location so they could pre-position for very large storms. The team moved many miles to get in the next location so they'd be ready for the following day. At that point, local media was very interested in knowing the next destination of Vortex 2. Associated with the position of the surface level and the ensemble members, and that black one there is the operational man. Uh, we'll have earlier initiation. This yellow line is 3,000 feet. You can't see the shear vectors here, but they're oriented perpendicular to the dry line, which is very favorable for storms initiating. Now, this is a, a product from uh, SPC, so, so there's a good chance we'll see a lot of precipitation. It's probably going to be the dry line. But thankfully, it's up to shore. We push the uh, position of the dry line by looking at the dew point here. The soundings look pretty darn good. Uh, photographs here, we have this really nice, uh, I call it a sick, it's not really a sick. Tomorrow seems like a slam dunk in terms of initiation somewhere in the warm sector. The next night we spent in Perry, Oklahoma, getting prepared for what looked like a very strong operational day to follow. The morning briefing brought even more information related to the intensity of the storms that had been predicted to be very high the day before, and in this case had intensified overnight. The weather services had indicated very high probabilities of very large tornadoes rapidly moving across Oklahoma. maintenance became even more intensified in the morning knowing that the operational day that would follow would be very long and arduous as well as dangerous. Lindsay Bennett, a senior research scientist from the UK, instructs the Discovery Channel crew on how to put together and operate a pod. Justin Walker and Herb Stein feverishly work on getting Dow 5 up and operating at this point, there were a number of tornadoes that were actually developing and moving at a rapid pace across Oklahoma. Everyone was paying close attention. Alex Gibbs monitors storm development with a very careful eye, seeing the intensity of the storms building in Oklahoma. Tim Marshall's team talks to media as well. Suddenly, Josh quickly moves towards the vehicles, indicating that we're ready to move. Supercell development intensified rapidly and got us moving into the field. Vortex 2 mobilizes and moves into operational mode. At this point, a number of powerful tornadoes are ripping across Oklahoma at high speed, going 50 to 60 miles an hour. On radar, these tornadoes are very strong and large. Various groups of Vortex 2 were sequentially deploying stick nets and other field monitoring instruments while others awaited the green light for deployment.
as the dry line moved eastward, huge, massive, warm, moist air exploded into Oklahoma with high levels of Cape. Powerful storms were racing across the state. Supercells grew rapidly and moved northeast. Certain units of Vortex 2 were mobilized quickly into the field. At this point, Vortex 2 teams were in the field transacting between tornadic supercells. Each probe or Doppler vehicle had to be carefully moving from one tornadic cell to another as the entire state had a number of severe storms in between. At one point we were informed by Vortex 2 radio that a town we were coming up on had just been hit by a tornado of significant strength. Down power lines here, be careful, keep your arms in in case any of these are live wires. After moving through a number of cells, we managed to get into position on another storm to the south that had significant structure. Probe trucks, support vehicles, and others waited for information from the Dow as to the strength of the storms that were approaching us rapidly. A number of potentially tornadic cells were moving in our direction. This one's not tornado warning. It's, it looks like it's cyclone. It's iffy, right yeah. yeah. It's cyclone, so I think we'll be able to go on. I need a one. As Dow Radar probed these cells, we marveled at the sheer beauty of the structures that were surrounding us. For all those present on this side of the storm, it gave us a strong operational sense of our mission, especially having passed through areas of such destruction. We knew our work had significance and merit in knowing that our efforts may help at some point in reducing the lead time that small towns and people have before they encounter severe storms or tornadoes. As we were driving back we had an absolutely beautiful sunset. Sometimes you get a sunset only like this after a severe storm has passed. I think we're coming up to the town. As we pass through towns with significant damage due to tornadic activity, we couldn't but help think the damage to people's lives and the property lost. It was a truly sorrowful moment for all of us as we passed through and saw such destruction that we had seen on the way out. The next day, the National Weather Service did significant damage surveys, estimating a number up to 12 tornadoes, some of significant strength in EF3 and EF4 categories, had passed through the areas that we had been through the day before. And to see it the following day brought home real understanding of the significant power of these tornadic storms. As you can see here, large power poles were split in two, and at the base of the pole, oddly enough, a huge semi had been thrown several hundred yards and wrapped around the power pole, indicating the strength of the tornado that had hit in this particular area. Small details of the tornado's strength were evidence everywhere as pieces of large steel had been wrapped and bent and trees had been torn to pieces and cars had been picked up and thrown hundreds of yards. By the very storms that we had been monitoring the day before. Paths of categories 1 through EF4 had been scattered throughout the land and numerous places had touched down indicating not only individual tornadoes with significant damage but also multi-vortex tornadoes. National Weather Service had a number of diverse assets that were able to track, help predict, 
and respond to these events. This gave us all a sobering sense of renewed purpose.